Tried and Blue, a play on the phrase tried and true, the Erlen Tried and Blue blog and podcast covers past and current successes that prove how effective and reliable our construction management services are. Welcome to the Tried and Blue podcast. I'm your host, Nicole Harrison. Today, I'll be talking with Wayne Peters from Can-Am Buildings and David O'Day from O'Day Engineers, as well as two Erlen team members on how they are currently utilizing a Hambro structural building system on one of our multifamily residential construction projects. Erlen Senior Project Manager Matt Combs will moderate and Project Manager Sean McDonald will be joining in as well to discuss this unique building system. But before we get started, Wayne, David, Matt, and Sean, can you tell the listeners a little bit about yourself? Wayne, you're up first. Sure. Um, Wayne Peters. I am Director of Project Management Site Supervision for Can-Am Buildings on the U.S. side. Been with them for about 10 years now and in the construction industry for over 20 years. I currently live in Coventry, Rhode Island. I have four boys, all of which who are not in construction, but in financial areas. I've been married for 34 years and Basically, I spend my off time golfing and traveling, and that's about it. Thanks, Wayne. All right, go ahead, David. Hi, everybody. I'm David O'Day. I'm a structural engineer, principal at the firm of O'Day Engineers. I'm uh, like Wayne. I'm also from Rhode Island. My firm is based here in Providence, uh, North Providence to be exact. And uh, uh, we also have an office in Boston, and we focus on building structural design for buildings of, of of all types. My background has always been in uh, in structures. I'm passionate about building safe and resilient infrastructure. Uh, I'm very active in the American Society of Civil Engineers and our profession and trying to grow the profession of structural engineers and our technical expertise. I'm uh, 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 very interested in running. I'm an avid runner and I also enjoy classical music. I'm on the board of Boston's Youth Symphony Orchestra, uh, which is a uh, a great project that brings music to young people throughout the, uh, the greater Boston area. Great. Thanks, David. Next up, we have Matt. Hi, my name's Matt Combs. I'm a senior project manager at Erland. I'm also the chair of our quality committee. I am originally from uh, Connecticut, so we got a good spread of southern New England here. Went to the University of Connecticut uh, and studied engineering there. Hobbies are golf, skiing, uh, like to travel. I also uh, am a pretty big avid history fan, um, so I get made fun of pretty regularly by my girlfriend when we're at the beach, and I bring along like an 800-page tome to read on the beach. Uh, that's it. Great. Thanks, Matt. All right, Sean, you're up. My name is Sean McDonald. I am a project manager in Erlen Construction. I'm also a chair of the uh, Young Operations Committee. Grew up in Massachusetts and currently live in Medford, which is a great town if you like Italian food like myself. For hobbies, I'm a big travel enthusiast. Try to travel whenever I can. I also enjoy playing guitar, golfing, uh, spending time down the Cape with family and friends. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Thanks for letting us get to know you a little bit better. Now let's take that a step further. Wayne, when you were a kid, what did you want to be when you grew up? I actually thought about this for a little bit. So when I graduated high school, I actually went to school for architecture because I was a good drawer and fascinated me. Uh, halfway through that, I switched careers and went into law enforcement and was in that for a while and pretty much ended up leaving there and going into construction where I found a happy home and settled in as a project manager and really liked all the aspects of building buildings and seeing them completed at the end. And that's pretty much it. Awesome. How about you, David? Well, when I was in elementary school and junior high school, I really wanted to be a fighter pilot. That was my, I love airplanes. I still love airplanes, especially really fast ones. And, uh, uh, unfortunately, I found out around that time that you have to have really good vision to be a pilot, and I have terrible vision. Uh, I have to wear contact lenses or glasses all the time. But one of the cool things about being a structural engineer or consulting engineer is you get to work with a lot of different clients in addition to housing, which is what we're going to talk about today. I do a lot of work for some uh, a client that manufactures really fast airplanes, and I get to go to their factory and check them out and even ride in them sometimes. So got a little bit of my wish. Yeah, that's great. It's nice to still have that overlap some some bit with what um, you previously 
thought you would do in your career to now. So Matt's been on the podcast before. So I was thinking about switching up his question. Matt, what is your favorite movie of all time and why? So I guess a little bit of an unconventional answer because it's not a movie that you would think of as, you know, favorite or greatest movie of all time. Uh, but I'd say Die Hard. Um, one, it has a special place because it was uh, when my my uh, mother went into labor. It was the movie that my parents were watching at the time. And then two, um, I think it's a great Christmas movie because it's based around Christmas time. So I always get to argue uh, with my girlfriend about that, that it's actually a Christmas movie. So it's one of the ones that you know, ever see it on TV, you have to just stop and watch it and have that debate. I knew that was the perfect question to ask you, Matt. <laughs> Great answer. Um, and last but not least, Sean, what did you want to be when you grew up? So when I was in high school, I actually wanted to be a musician, I played in a band. Um, that dream kind of fizzled out quickly. After going to college, I mainly focused on business and communications and, and economics and wanted to be either a sports agent or a publicist for film studios. So after college, I spent some time doing marketing and publicity for some film studios between Phoenix and Las Vegas before moving out to London to do uh, financial advertising. Obviously, my whole family has a pretty extensive construction background. So moved to New York City after that and gave construction a shot. And I ended up loving it. Just loved it having new challenges on every project and working with teams and just seeing a tangible result for all of your time and effort that goes into it. Just really exciting too, just driving past past projects that you've worked on. And it's just been a great career shift for me. Great. Thanks, Sean. You know, we could always have you back on the podcast, you know, play the guitar a little bit for us or something. <laughs> Love hearing these stories. I know as a kid, I had always gone back and forth between different occupations myself. It's fun to see where our paths actually led us, though. All right, let's jump into today's discussion. I'm now going to hand over the mic to Matt to moderate. So, Wayne, I just thought before we get into it, I was thinking about your career choices as a kid. I think you found the perfect middle ground. You went from design to law enforcement. I think construction somewhere right in between. I think you got to have a little bit of knowledge of both. <laughs> Yeah, I, I agree with that completely. <laughs> so do you want to start off, Wayne, by kind of just giving people a, some background on what the Hambro system is, how it works, uh, and what some of the advantages that you see in it? Yep, sure. So the Hambro structural building system is a combination of our Hambro composite floor system, light gauge load bearing steel stud walls, permanent concrete shear walls, uh, system and open web steel joists with deck on the roof. It's used to create a safe, non combustible, and efficient steel superstructure. Our systems can be used on a variety of jobs, including single family homes, multi residential buildings, hotels, assisted living facilities, high rise structures, and can be utilized anywhere from one to 30 plus stories. Quickly, we offer Two different types of uh, Hambro floor system, the D500 in which the joists are held in place by a plywood forming system with roll bars that get removed once the concrete is poured and set. We also offer an MD2000 system which uses a stay in place metal deck in place of the plywood forms. The benefits for both floor systems are identical as far as fire rating, sound and ductability go. It's just uh, depending on what type of um, system best fits that type of construction. So, David, when you guys were starting to take a look at the design of the building, what, what special considerations did you have to make or what, what advantages did you realize through the process? Well, Matt, we're the, the structural engineers of record for the building. So our client is, is the architect, in this case, Stantec Architecture. We do a lot of this type of work with. And our role is really to look at all of the, uh, first of all, look at the different structural options to achieve a frame and the layout that the architect and the owner is looking for. And then make sure that the loads from that structure, which for structural engineers, those are the weight of the structure, the weight of the floors and all the stuff inside the building, and also the lateral loads, the wind and earthquake and other loads that the building code prescribes for us, uh, have a load path. They can make it from where the load is down into the foundation system. So we really have to put all the pieces together. 
When we're working with the Hambro system, there's a, there's a lot of key elements that you have to coordinate early on. Uh, as Wayne mentioned, it's a load-bearing wall system. <clears throat> so in that respect, it's similar to, say, a light frame wood structure, but with some big advantages. Uh, for one, the spans of the floor can actually be quite longer for a thinner structure because it's made out of steel. Uh, secondly, the, the, the optimal placement of those load-bearing walls might be a little bit different than the way it is for a light frame wood structure, particularly since the Hambro system is a non-combustible structure. You don't have some of the same limitations with fire-treated construction that you might have, say, with a, uh, a light frame building. So a lot of what we're doing early on in selecting a system is looking at the different design options, working on the load path, where the loads are, um, how they're distributed to the base structure. This building also has a parking garage underneath it, one story of parking. So it has long spans. The bearing walls of the Hambro system do not extend down into the parking garage. Um, obviously, we can't, we can't do that because the cars wouldn't be able to get through the drive lane. So we had to design a structure that could support those walls. In this case, it was post-tension concrete. Uh, all of this working together with Erland, with uh, Can-Am and, and Hambro's great engineering team, big advantage of working with them is that they have engineers on staff that really understand the system and the components. With the architect and mechanical engineers to understand where all the system elements are. Um, and with your team, Matt and Sean, to understand constructability that you could build this building and put all the pieces together for us in the field. Thanks, Dave. Sean, how do you, would you say, I mean, now that we're kind of, we're, we're up pretty much on our, our second level of the Hamborough now, how would you say things are going on site? What are you seeing uh, as far as how things are going together? It's moving very quickly. Um, I mean, we just started just over a month ago and uh, it's shocking every time we go out to the site and I see how much progress has been made in just a few days. So everything's been going pretty smoothly so far, I'd say. Um, it's been great working with K&M. We're essentially meeting every two weeks now and, and kind of mapping out the next two weeks after that for deliveries and schedule and um, just very collaborative um, experience so far working with them. So it's been great. Yeah, one of the things that I thought was cool in coordination was, uh, so like David was saying, we have the um, a concrete parking garage structure at the grade level. And uh, so we have concrete shear walls there with the, um, the Can-Am wall system, our conch shear walls are a continuation up above of that. So Can-Am actually made some templates for us so that all the bar would line up continuous uh, when we were sticking our, our dowels in for the lower shear walls. I thought that was a pretty cool process. And one of the things I've been happiest about so far is I haven't gotten any phone calls from Wayne saying, none of our building panels aren't are fitting on the building what's going on out there that's usually a pretty good indication that the coordination went pretty well yeah i'd like to have that on a lot of jobs to be honest with you <laughs> so far so good yeah an important yeah. part of that matt sorry to interrupt you but it's just that early collaboration and coordination that's what really makes the project a success i mean the fact that you know we didn't just bring wayne and his team in after everything was designed they were involved right from the start and they gave us advice on, you know, how best to construct this building, not just how to optimize the, the materials, but what would what would make your life easier and, and make the job go more smoothly. Yeah, like uh, exactly what David just said. We can am likes to be involved early on. It makes for a much better process coordination wise and the buildings seem to go up much better. One of the things I was observing looking at the structure going up is when we do wood framing, uh, it, it feels like there's more shear walls, there's more uh, elements. To, it just seems relatively a fewer amount of shear walls, David. Is that is that something that actually was able to be realized through the design? Yes, Matt, absolutely. The the nature of the Hambro system, the load-bearing uh, steel frame system with a slab for the floors is very different from, say, what you might compare this to with a wood frame, light frame structure. Uh, they have the same loads on them, essentially, the same wind loads, if you think about it. The building envelope is the same. The wind doesn't know if the building's steel or wood. Mm -hmm. uh, but the way that those loads make their way down from the walls where they're applied into the foundations is very different. 
And that's because of the differences in the, uh, in the systems. In a wood frame structure, we typically use every demising wall between the, the units as a, we call it a shear wall. That's what structural engineers call the walls that are rigid walls that resist the wind loads. We, we make those walls with plywood. Using the, the Hambro system or similar types of, of systems, we're actually using concrete shear walls and we have a concrete floor. Uh, engineers call that concrete floor the diaphragm of the structure. In a concrete diaphragm, the spans between those shear walls, the distances between them, can actually be quite a bit longer uh, than they can in a wood frame building just because of the increased stiffness and rigidity of the, of the concrete. Now, Hambro in particular, Can-Am in particular, makes a great modular concrete shear wall system with stay in place forms that are placed, you know, they have a template in them for the rebar. They're actually placed by the erector on the site in the locations where we want to put those concrete walls. In many cases, we were able to align them with, you know, stairway walls and unit walls that could continue down in between parking places. So it was a very efficient way to resist the loads. And like you said, Matt, there are fewer of them compared to a wood frame system where you really need more of a distributed shear wall system to make the uh, to make the project work structurally. Yeah. Yeah. For anybody who's curious what those let's look like, it's like a, it's like a 15 foot hair comb, uh, made out of a flat steel plate that just is all slotted for the bars to, to align with where they have to. Uh, and, and I think Can-Am did a great job of, of providing those to us and coordinating those two. And we haven't had any problems setting those shear walls yet. So kudos to the team on that. Um, Sean, I know you were involved in pre-construction uh, a lot more than I was. Um, any thoughts that you want to share with the listeners on, on what we saw on our end as far as pricing and coordination during pre-construction? Yeah, and I know David briefly touched on this, but it was a pretty extensive pre-construction process. We had weekly coordination meetings, I think, all the way back from the beginning of April 2021 all the way to the end of August to finalize the design for Erwin, typically we aren't quite as involved in the design process during pre-construction, but collaborating with the design team and having Can-Am uh, work with us as well was a great experience that really prepared us for the construction phase of the project. It's also worth noting that these coordination meetings all happened post-pandemic, so Zoom was frequently used, which was a big benefit at the time. It made things a lot easier, cheaper for all parties to meet and work through the design and cost issues as well. So having Can-Am so involved in design assist certainly disease construction on the back end, which was well worth the time spent. From a cost standpoint, we were given a price early on by Can-Am, which they held to throughout the pre-construction process for a very reasonable lump sum pre-con fee. There were some minor adjustments in the overall price due to design changes that came up during design development, which was expected. But for the most part, that price really held. This was also during a time of extreme volatility when it came to material price. And so it was a huge benefit knowing that the cost of the superstructure was somewhat locked in. And furthermore, just having the design team and ownership and Earl and all buy into this design made it very productive. All the meetings moving forward, we were kind of working with a proprietary turnkey system. So it eliminated some of the competition aspects, but it really helped drive the design process forward um, and, and, and allowed us to, to prepare ourselves for the project. Yeah, no, I, I, as I got more and more involved in the kind of coordination after construction had just gotten started, I know one of our key concerns was coordinating with the post tension slab that, that consists of the podium. Uh, we could have a whole other podcast on talking about the post tension work of that. But one thing that we did do that I think has been successful is we laid out all the high points of the tendons on top of the slab because KM has these big kickers that they have to put up as their as temporary braces while they're erecting the walls. So there was, there was a fair amount of coordination with, uh, with that. Um, certainly there was a lot of coordination with the MEP trades. Um, one thing that it just is kind of worth bringing up for any listeners considering a system like this, particularly good for an architect to consider, is, is the, uh, the exterior walls sit on top of each other in the system. So there's a there's a beam on top of the exterior walls and in the corridor, they're, they're separated by the slab, but they also have a little beam on top of the walls. So sometimes people look to use those, those corridor walls in particular as a wet wall um, for plumbing chases. 
So uh, we were we were obviously Stantec was involved early on uh, with RWS, who was the MVP engineer, and we were able to to assign locations for all the chases. So that hasn't been an issue. Uh, but I could see where somebody could could run into an issue there if they didn't think about that. Wayne, are there any other design aspects that you would, any lessons learned from other projects that you would recommend to any uh, architects, engineers? Um, I, I would just reiterate about getting Can-Am involved early on in the process. Um, it helps a lot. It, you know, if we come in after the fact, it, it doesn't really work as well. We like to be involved early. And that's basically it. I mean, the system itself speaks for itself. It, it, as you guys can see, it goes up fast. Once we get moving, it, it flies. Yeah, no, it, and there's, there's another construction advantage that we're starting to see, which is when we do a wood frame project, we usually, for a safety perspective, we put an empty floor in between erection and letting uh, the, the wet trades go in and start putting piping in or the drywall or putting in the interior wall, starting to frame that. With the, with the concrete slab in this system, we're actually going to start putting the interior framer in there sooner. So we're able to accelerate the succeeding trades uh, a little bit quicker into the project, which that, that's certainly going to help push the schedule. Sean, anything logistically uh, on the project that you can see? Anything different than any of our other projects? Not really. I mean, it's not too different from a wood panel job. I mean, we still have a crane out there. We're taking deliveries for each section. I mean, just like I mentioned before, just, just meeting with Can-Am and kind of staying on top of the schedule and, and planning out all of our deliveries to make sure they're not taking up too much space and we can keep everyone productive is, is really what we just need to continue doing. But as you mentioned, too, it's just great. Just the accessibility that allows other trades to begin their work has been a huge benefit as well. I mean, we're just getting into that now with interior framing just starting in a few weeks here. So, yeah, not, nothing too different. Great. Uh, David, do you have any other thoughts on anything you want to share with the listeners? I'd say from a structural perspective, you know, some key things to look out for if you're if you're used to designing load bearing wood frame structures, which a lot of times in this in this project, this is what we substituted the system for. You, know, you have to be aware of the differences of the systems and you want to use them to their benefit. So for the Hambro system, you, you you really as a designer want to take advantage of the longer spans you can get out of the system compared to what you might do with with a wood frame structure where it's beneficial to have a lot more bearing walls. You know, so in the case of this you mentioned Matt that we're using load bearing walls at the exterior and the corridors. You know, you can do that with wood too. You end up with pretty deep trusses if you if you do that. And it's not common in um, in buildings that have fire treated lumber on the exterior walls. It is, however, the preferred approach for this type of project with Hambro, because that span can easily be easily be made with a fairly shallow uh, truss and slab system. Now, the thing about that is you change the fundamental flow of forces through the structure. Now, instead of having you know more lightly loaded bearing walls with a higher frequency on the podium which in this case, as we said, is post-tension concrete, the loads are more concentrated in fewer walls. So in this project, we have, uh, we have corridor load-bearing walls that have a very heavy load on them. Uh, the loads are, are also a little higher than wood because of the weight. The system's heavier because it uses a slab. So you get the benefits of the rigid slabs, but they also have more load on them. They have more dead load. So that's an important consideration. It, it will result in changes to the design for the podium. It's not the same podium for wood as it is for, for Hambro. It's different. You need to consider that in your design. You might need a thicker slab, or maybe if you're using a steel podium, you might need to rethink the, the location of your load transfer beams, make sure that they're in the right spot and you have good a good span to depth ratio. So all of these things impact the overall design of the building. So it's important to consider these things early on in the process. Don't wait until construction documents to lay out the bearing walls. You should be doing this in schematic design and in design development, because in a bearing wall building, the walls are the architectural walls and they're also the structural walls. So that's mm -hmm. always a you know, source of, uh, of, of coordination challenges on projects. And this one's no different. 
So those are some key things I, you know, kind of lessons learned. We're, we're, you know, looking at using the Hamburg system for some, some other projects. One great thing is you can reach out to Wayne and his team and, and they'll give you advice. You know, they'll give you uh, uh, concepts and ideas to the structural engineer and the architect so that they're, if you're going to use Hambro or if you think it's an option, you use it in the right way so that it's, so that it's optimized and the system makes sense. So you got me thinking a little bit about how how you have more of the concentrated load bearing walls, but for our, for our owner developer friends, there's, there's some big hidden advantages in that because they have flexibility down the road. If they ever want to go back and change the layout of the building for, for a different market need as things change um, for long-term holders of buildings, that's pretty attractive to be able to change the, the layout of the building. Yeah, for sure. It gives you, that is definitely an advantage of having uh, you know, more sparse layout of bearing walls. You, if in the future you want to switch to a different unit type, you know, cut holes in the door, you know, for doors or um, pass-throughs, combined units, well, it's a lot easier. You know, every, every renovation has challenges, but when you have fewer bearing walls, it definitely is a, a good, a good thing. Mm-hmm. Wayne, uh, you're, I think we're also seeing you do have a lot of support on your guys' side uh, throughout shop drawings and pre-construction and everything leading up to this. It seems like you have a pretty healthy team of, of engineers and people working uh, back at your home offices. Um, so I would I would agree with David that the, the technical support that we got was exceptional. I don't know if there's anything else you want a spouse on as far as your guys' capabilities and level of support you provide. Uh, yeah, I mean, we like to be very involved. So we have teams of engineers, actually worldwide. We have detailers all the way into Romania. So we're pretty heavily covered on the that aspect. So we have answers for questions right away, and we're always available for anything or to answer anything. One thing I'm looking forward to seeing is my feeling is that this is going to end up being a pretty quiet product. It just, it seems more robust than a wood structure. There's, there's certain things we, we are challenged with in wood, you know, in the elements for dealing with mold and uh, in, in microbial growth on the wood. It, certainly they can lead to a little bit noisier of a building on your, on your floor decks. I think that this is my gut feeling is that we're going to end up with a pretty, pretty sturdy, quiet product. Also, one of my favorite things we, aren't going to have to do is I hate gypcrete. So I'm looking forward to not being able to do my first residential project like this style without having to do any gypcrete. I would that. agree with that too. I mean, with the Hambro system, it has documented acoustical properties. So I think the system itself has like a SDC up to 57 and ICC up to 30, which is a huge benefit as well. Yeah. Well, let me point out one other big advantage of steel frame structures in general over wood is they don't shrink. So this is a huge issue with wood frame construction that everyone has to keep in mind, you know, as we build taller and taller wood buildings and, you know, at O'Day Engineers, we do a lot of wood mass timber and light frame construction. No matter what it is, wood is an organic material. You know, you can dry it out as much as you want in the, in the factory, but it's subject to those variations of moisture and will expand and contract often at odds with other building materials that don't like to expand like drywall or brick veneer. Um, Spot on. So I think it's a big, you know, from a quality standpoint, having the, uh, the precision and the tolerances and the geometric stability of steel and concrete. You always have a little, you get shrinkage in concrete. It's not that concrete doesn't shrink, uh, but certainly the floor to floor through height stability, geometric stability of the building is much improved. And for us, that's a huge, structurally, that's a huge advantage. It just takes away a problem that, um, or challenge that you have with wood that, you know, you can really kind of becomes a non-issue for the most part with, with steel. I agree with that. Tolerance and wood framing. And I'd also say too, to add to that is just, um, just using the gyp sheathing versus the OSB sheathing is just creates a much better substrate for waterproofing facade mm -hmm. finishes. So that's a huge advantage as well. Going back to Matt's point too, as far as uh, acoustical properties go, Hambro has a rating of STC 57, which is actually one of the highest in the industry. So 
And then once you add the pad and carpeting, it actually increases to about 69 to 70. It's pretty impressive. All right. I think we hit on a pretty good range of topics. I don't know if anybody had anything else that they were burning to share. I'll throw in one more. Um, I also think just just the large web openings that, that come with the KM system is is really helps for the MEP standpoint, just maximizing the duck openings, just really generous mechanical chaseways, which is going to help a lot uh, in just moving the, the project along. So that's been a benefit as well. Absolutely. And I'll add, um, you know, just to conclude my remarks, that, that to me a big uh, thing that I see here and what's very rewarding when I see it at the site is prefabrication of as much as possible. You know, we talked a little bit about quality control and efficiency, but prefabrication is really the key to a high quality, optimized, efficient construction project. And we think about, we don't think about it enough in the design approach that we take as engineers and architects, because we're, we're used to building with, you know, kind of just being building whatever we want. Every building is a prototype. Somebody once said, <laughs> it wasn't me. I'm just copying them. I don't know who it was, but every building shouldn't be a prototype. You know, it should be more like manufacturing. I mentioned, you know, one of my favorite clients that I work for makes, makes airplanes, you know, and watching these guys build, they're basically building with similar technologies to what we have. They're using, you have to weld metal together. They have to put, you know, complex pieces and parts together. Their project, their things they're building are much more complex than what we build an order of magnitude more complex, but they come together with amazing precision when they put them together in the plant. You know, these are, these are very complex, like a Swiss watch, these machines. And it's because they take advantage of prefabrication and construction automation in the plant, but things that you can do in a factory that you can't do in the field because of, because of the environment that you have. Now, airplanes aren't welded by a welder out there outside welding parts together. They're welded by robots. You know, steel fabrication, prefabrication of these elements can be done by skilled craftsmen or automated systems in the plant, in the shop. And seeing them come out there, the reason you have good quality is because they're inspected before they even get to the site. You know, and that, that can be done with wood too. That can be done with other systems. But I think that the general point is the idea of prefabrication really improves the quality and constructability of, of projects. And we need to, we need to stress that theme more in the work that we're doing. Yeah, I think we, we agree with that on our end in construction. There's no substitute for a controlled environment. You know, like you were talking about with wood, you could, you can prefabricate and you can dry it out and everything can be, but you still have to build it in the real world. So, you know, I think on a lot of our projects, we probably see as much as a, a quarter of an inch and 10 feet of shrinkage in wood, which is substantial on it on something that has a, a, an intricate facade design or, or, you know, something that's very sensitive on tolerances. I, I think we are seeing a push towards more prefabrication. Uh, and I think that's good for our industry as a whole. Um, I think it's, it obviously brings in advantages on cost reduction, uh, schedule acceleration, because now you can have things being produced all at the same time, all across the country uh, and, and arrive when you need it. That's a very strong push that I think our industry has been making and we have to continue to push for it. Well, it's been great having you all on this month's podcast. Thank you for sitting down with me. Thanks for having us. Thanks, Nicole. Wayne, David, Matt, and Sean, can you tell the listeners the best way to connect with you if they have any additional questions regarding this topic? Um, Wayne, do you want to go first? Sure. Um, by email, it's wayne.peters at canamgroupinc.com, or I am on LinkedIn. We can connect on LinkedIn as well. David? For me, uh, I think LinkedIn's probably the best way. Just search me out on uh, LinkedIn. I'm a pretty active user. David O'Day, O-D-E-H. Awesome. And Matt? I go with the same thing. I think LinkedIn's probably the best way to get in touch with me. Again, my my last name is Combs, C-O-M-B as in boy, S as in Sam. And Sean? Likewise, LinkedIn. It's under Sean McDonald. Great. M-C, not M-A-C. <laughs> That's it for today's Tried and Blue. We hope you join us next time for another exciting sit down with other Erlen team members and even maybe some special guests. Keep checking our website to tune in. 